steps to get into this Capitol building here in Washington. But I wonder who that stack of scrap of paper is. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I'm sitting here on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a long, long journey to the Capitol City. It's a long, long week while I'm sitting in committee. But I know I'll be a law someday. At least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. Gee, Bill, you certainly have a lot of patience and courage. Well, I got this far. When I started, I wasn't even a bill. I was just an idea. Some folks back home decided they wanted a law passed, so they called their local congressman, and he said, you're right, there ought to be a law. And he sat down and wrote me out and introduced me to Congress, and I became a bill. And I'll remain a bill until they decide to make me a law. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. Well, now I'm stuck in committee, and I'll sit here and wait. While a few key congressmen discuss and debate whether they should let me be alone. Oh, I hope and pray that they will, but today I'm still just a bill. and debate about you? Yeah, I'm one of the lucky ones. Most bills never even get this far. I hope they decide to report on me favorably, otherwise I may die. Die? Yeah, die in committee. Oh, but it looks like I'm going to live. Now I go to the House of Representatives and they vote on me. If they vote, yes, what happens? Then I go to the Senate and the whole thing stacks all over again. Oh, no. Oh, yes. I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. <laughs> Trying to insult your intelligence. <laughs> Although some of you needed that. <laughs> it's a good song. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, now we turn to a brand new episode of Schoolhouse Rock. What is this? What is this?
Yep, that's what you're going to do. Oh, my God. Well, I didn't have time to read myself. Whoa! <laughs> okay, go big or go home, huh? Yeah, we talked about how checks and balances are controversial. I mean, executive orders are controversial because they may um, bypass checks and balances. All right, we're going to start writing that down. This is for Chapter 13, Lesson 2, a continuation of your notes from last time on Friday. <clears throat> Those of you that were not here on Friday and you copied down the notes that are online, these were already included in there. You don't need to copy this down anymore. <clears throat> There's two questions on this particular part of your notes on your multiple choice section. So make sure you put a star on each one of those paragraphs. <clears throat> when it comes to military and foreign affairs, the president's role is to lead the army and execute a war plan. He may commit troops to another country without a declaration of war every now and then, but he is limited by the War Powers Act. Congress's role is to appropriate funds to the executive branch, give him money to be able to pursue a war. They cannot do this without one another. <clears throat> if Congress and the President are in disagreement about whether or not we should be at war with another country, then war will not take place. <clears throat> The president can attack Mexico tomorrow, but Congress can remove the funds from the military, and Trump will have to go home. Congress can declare war on Mexico tomorrow, but it is Trump's job to pursue that war, and if he chooses not to, then he doesn't have to. This next one is on your test for sure. When it comes to foreign affairs, the president usually gets what he wants from Congress. Usually Congress bends over backwards to help the president when it comes to foreign affairs. The president wins most of the time. We talked about how when it comes to foreign affairs and military issues, we need somebody that can make quick and decisive decisions, and Congress recognizes that it's not them that can make, the, that can make those decisions. It is the President of the United States that's able to make those decisions in a quick, decisive manner that we all need. <clears throat> so when it comes to foreign affairs, Congress gives the President a lot of leeway and usually supports the President when it comes to foreign affairs. That's why it's important who we put in, in the White House, because whoever is the President of the United States usually gets to dictate our foreign policy, because Congress is not going to be willing to go against the president when it comes to foreign affairs. They usually let him do whatever he wants. And whatever checks that they have on the president, most of the time they choose not to exercise it. But when it comes to domestic affairs, Congress usually wins out, beats the president when it comes to um, affairs at home. When it comes to foreign affairs, the president wins. When it comes to affairs inside of the United States, Congress usually prevails. Make sure you put a star on that. That's going to be your test. <clears throat> Foreign affairs, the president usually gets what he wants from Congress. Congress usually bends over backwards. <clears throat> Another hat that he wears is he is the crisis manager. The crisis manager, the president deals with national <coughs> incidents. He leads one of our government agencies called FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. This is a federal department or bureaucracy that deals with disasters such as hurricanes, tornadoes. <clears throat> Again, same thing here, same thing like in war. We need somebody that can make quick, decisive issue and decisions when people's lives are on the line, and that's not Congress. Congress is not going to be able to make those decisive decisions. So when it comes to disaster, usually it is the president's job to deal with those disasters. Congress is just too slow most of the time. Terrorist attacks, hurricanes, it's usually the president's job to deal with them. And as a consequence, if 
the government's handling of a disaster is very bad, that goes on the president, not Congress. The president gets blamed for it. If you want to look at an example, Katrina is one of the worst environmental and, and catastrophes in the United States. That was largely blamed on George W. Bush because the president handles disasters in the United States. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. Chapter 13, lesson three, guys. Today, it's all about the president and public opinion. And why does it matter for the president to have people on his side, to have the public on his side? Isn't he the most powerful man in America? <coughs> Because the president still has to operate in an environment of checks and balances. There's very little Trump can do without the other branches of government, especially Congress. <clears throat> and one way to get Congress to be on your side, one way to get the other branches to be on your side, is to get your, the people on your side first. Remember, the people that elect, the constituencies that elect these senators and House of Representatives members are the American people. And if the American people supports the President of the United States, Congress is going to be more willing to support the President of the United States. They don't want to go against their constituency and risk not getting reelected next year. <clears throat> so, because of checks and balances, the President has to persuade the other branches, especially Congress, to follow his agenda. And he's able to do this better if the public is on his side. If he's popular, Congress is going to fall in line. <clears throat> a congressman does not want to risk going against a popular president because he would be risking his re-election. <clears throat> When FDR was president, and you're a congressman, and you go against FDR, one of the most popular presidents in US history, then you are committing political suicide. You're going to lose your re-election campaign. So it's important for the president that he's popular, because if he's popular, Congress will fall in line. Congress will follow him and pass the laws, whatever bills that he wants them to pass. If you're Donald Trump right now and your approval ratings is around 30% and 40%, it's going to be harder for you to get Congress to do what you want, pass the bills that you would like them to pass, because you're unpopular. It's easier for them to not support you. You're giving them a reason not to pass the bills you want them to pass. <clears throat> Alright, there's this idea called presidential coattails. And this only happens if the president is popular. If the president is popular, and you're a voter, and you want to support the president, you want to help him accomplish his agenda, what's the best thing to do during congressional elections? Let's say you love Trump, and you think Trump should be able to accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish. What's the best thing to do in the midterm elections in this year? Vote for Republicans. Vote for uh, uh, congressmen from the, from the president's own party. Because when they get to Congress, they're more likely to help out the president. And you don't want to vote for Democrats because they're going to be le um, less likely to be willing to help out Trump. So this is called presidential coattails because congressmen are riding on the president's popularity so that they can also get reelected or they can also get elected into Congress. But again, this only matters if the president is popular. Voters vote for congressmen from a popular president's party <clears throat> to try to help him out. <clears throat> if the president's unpopular, the opposite happens. If you don't like Donald Trump, you want as many checks on him as possible, so you're going to give control to the Democrats for the Senate or the House of Representatives, so Donald Trump is not able to do whatever he wants. <clears throat> A 
Again, this is more effective if the president is popular. I just got done making your quiz for tomorrow, and depending on which version you get, you're going to get a question about electoral mandates. <clears throat> this is going to be also in your multiple choice. A electoral mandate is not a tangible thing, it's a perception. The perception of whether or not the people support you as president, whether or not the people want you to accomplish the things that you promise them they're going to accomplish. So electoral mandate is a perception. <clears throat> perception of authority from the people for winning an election. So once a president wins an election, there's a perception that he has authority from the American people to accomplish the agenda that he set during his campaign. <clears throat> when Donald Trump got elected, there was an electoral mandate for him to accomplish all the things that he promised us he was going to accomplish. The stronger that perception, the more willing Congress is going to be to help out the president. <clears throat> because they don't want to go against the American people. So the stronger the perception of a mandate, the more cooperative congressmen will be. <clears throat> Anybody know what that perception depends on? How strong or how weak that perception of authority from the people, what does it depend on? How do we know someone has a strong mandate from the American people? How do we know someone has a weak mandate from the American people to accomplish the things that he wants to accomplish? It depends on the election. It depends on how what? Close. How close the election is. If the president wins by a huge margin, is it going to be stronger or weaker? It's going to be stronger. Because it's going to seem like this is what the people really, really want. They chose you and they really, really wanted you to accomplish the things you promised them. But if you only win by a slim margin, that perception is not going to be as strong. Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. For some people, that perception of a mandate is very weak. Because Hillary Clinton got 3 million more votes than he did. But luckily for our presidents, <clears throat> The Electoral College, oh by the way, you can put here, depends on the margin of victory. The Electoral College exaggerates the margin of victory. <coughs> the Electoral College system makes it seem like somebody won by a lot when they didn't really win by much. And in Donald Trump's case, he won by like 70 to 90 electoral votes, even though he didn't win most of the popular votes. The electoral college system makes it seem like somebody has a mandate, when really, he doesn't, or he shouldn't. <clears throat> but they, uh, fortunately for most presidents, that electoral college system exaggerates the margin of victory. All right. <clears throat> During midterm elections, and this is going to be on your test, we talked about midterm elections before. Midterms ele midterm elections happen in between what kind of elections? Presidential, presidential elections. So we had um, a presidential election in 2016. We're going to have another one in 2020. So the midterm election is this year. We get to elect House of Representative members, and we get to elect some senators this year. During the midterm elections, here's the thing that you need to know. The president is the most popular in the early months of his presidency. In the early, the, the first few months of his presidency, that's when he's going to be the most popular. But as his presidency goes by, according to recent trends, he's going to be less and less popular. That by the time the midterm election hits, he's not going to be as popular as he used to be. And that has an impact on congressional elections. So what can we expect 
in our midterm elections this year when it comes to Congress. The Republican Donald Trump is not as popular as he used to be anymore. What are we gonna what, what are we gonna expect? That the president's party in Congress is going to lose seats and there's gonna be more Democrats that get elected. This has been the trend in the United States. This what this happened to Obama, this happened to George W. Bush. By the time the midterm election hits, the president is so unpopular that the people um, take it out on his party and they vote for the opposite party. So what we can expect in 2018 is more Democrats getting elected into Congress and Republicans losing their seats by the time the midterm election hits. <clears throat> so this is going to be on your test. Remember this, during midterm elections, the president's party usually loses seats in Congress. Because the president is less popular by the time the midterm election hits, they usually lose seats. And that can mean a divided government. Right now we have a unified government, Republicans control everything. <clears throat> but 2018 can change that. And one or both houses of Congress can fall to the Democrats, and Donald Trump is going to have a very difficult time getting his agenda through. The president will have a difficult time convincing Congress if he has a divided government. on this part. Talk about another concept in terms of the popularity of the president. Let's talk about the honeymoon phase. Like I told you before, the president is the most popular during what the period of time that we call the honeymoon phase. This is the first few months of his presidency. <clears throat> so, the first few months of his presidency, this is where the president is going to be most popular. This is Obama's approval ratings. In 2008, when he gets elected, that's when he was the most popular. 70% approval rating. It's very, very good for a president. But like all marriages, it goes downhill from there. That's what happens with all presidents. They're the most popular in the very beginning, and they go down at the end. So, if you're the president of the United States, you should know that. You should know that when you get into office, you get elected in November, you're not going to serve until January. When you get into office, that's when you're going to be the most popular. That's when Congress is going to be more willing to help you out. After that, it's going to be, get more difficult and difficult for Congress to pass the bills you want them to pass. So what you should do as a president and as a new president is, before you even step into the White House, you should have bills lined up, getting ready to get through Congress. Because those first few months are key. Because those first few months is when you're going to be more likely to get those bills passed. After those first few months, Congress is going to be more stubborn and they're going to go <laughs> more against you. So the first few months you need to take advantage of because that's when Congress is going to be more willing to help you out. So during the honeymoon phase, the president usually gets a lot of things done. <clears throat> the president is most popular during the first few months of this presidency. Congress is more willing to pass to help the president <clears throat> during the honeymoon phase. <clears throat> Well, by the time the midterm election hits, he's not as popular anymore, and his party suffers as a result. <clears throat> All right, moving on. This is President Trump's approval ratings. The green or the black um, line is his disapproval rating. I mean, his approval ratings, and the red line is a, is his approval ratings. So as you can see. He's not doing really well. 
his, approval, his disapproval ratings are going up while his approval ratings are going down. Now, let's talk about how do you get public support if you're president? If you're the president of the United States, you know to get Congress in line, the Congress to help you out and pass the bills you want them to pass, you're going to need the public on your side. So the question that we have to answer is, how can a president do that? How can a president get the American people, people on his side? And the answer to that is the bully pulpit. No other public figure in the United States gets more attention than the President of the United States. No senator, no House of Representative member, no judge or justice in the federal courts gets more attention than the President of the United States. And this can either kill him and bury him, or this can, he can use this to his advantage. He has a platform that we call the bully pulpit. The President gets attention from the media and the public. The bully pulpit is the platform he can use to gain public support. All president know, all presidents know that all eyes are on them. And they can either shy away from that and not be able to use it, or they can use that attention, they can use that platform, they can use their bully pulpit to get the public on their side and pressure Congress to do what they want. <coughs> With public support, Congress will be more cooperative if a president is able to utilize the bully pulpit, the attention that's given to him by the public and the media correctly, then he can use that to win the hearts and minds of the American people and in turn pressure Congress so that they can do what the president wants them to do. <clears throat> Some presidents are better at it than others. Some presidents just plain suck at it. But if you're, gonna, if you're able to utilize the bully pulpit to your advantage, you're going to be a more effective president. Those of you here that you're from U.S. history, you've heard of that speech by JFK, how uh, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. That's him utilizing the bully pulpit to get his agenda through. Another example is Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan wanted to implement tax cuts in the United States. He wanted to cut the budget, uh, the, to cut taxes for, 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 um, for Americans, especially the middle class. Congress was not willing to help him out. They weren't willing to pass his tax bill. So he goes in front of the television and explains to the American people the benefits of the tax cuts that he wants to give them. And he told them, if you, if you agree with me, go call your congressman, go call your senator, so that they can help me pass these tax cuts. That's the president using the bully pulpit, using the attention given to him to his advantage. So an example on this one, Ronald Reagan. State of the Union, we talked about this before, the speech the president has to give every now and then. Uh, president, it can be used to put public pressure on Congress. presidents can utilize is what we call rally events. Events that unify the country. There are just moments in American history where uh, the American people for some reason <clears throat> feel one and there's a sense of nationality that pervades the American public and those are what we call rally events. They're usually very very bad events like a catastrophe, a terrorist attack, a war, a depression, things that would put us together as a country and evoke some sort of nationalistic ideal. It's usually bad for us because people die, but it's good for the president's poll numbers. 
because that's when pre uh, but that's when the American people unite and they support the government and they support whoever is in charge. So I'll show you an example. And this is not just to mock Donald Trump. I don't want you to think about that. So this is the poll numbers for uh, Donald Trump compared to other United States presidents. Like, for example, Harry S. Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower. As you can see, he's low when it comes to approval numbers. He didn't start out great, and he's going down. <clears throat> but what I want you to notice is this one right here. George W. Bush. He was hovering around 50% approval rating. Then this. What's this? That's 9-11. That's when... Uh, we, get a, we get attacked by Al-Qaeda, and that united the country, and for some reason, they support the president. And whatever law, even very controversial law, that Bush wanted to get passed through Congress, Congress was willing to bend over backwards for him because he was very popular after 9-11. So an example of this would be Bush during 9-11. Very controversial laws against civil liberties and civil rights were passed after 9-11. Things that Bush wanted, <clears throat> Congress was very willing to help him out. That was a rally event. He was popular. He can get away with more things than he could before. <clears throat> All right, guys, we're not going to, because we need to do your quiz. I'm just going to go over this with you guys. This is checks and balances again. A lot of this is just review. I'm going to leave this on your Google Classroom. So tonight you got some homework besides studying for your quiz tomorrow. Just copy this down. It's going to be in your Google Classroom. All right. Help me fill it out, though. What can Congress do to the president? They, they can override his what? They can override his veto. So what, what do you put here? He can veto. Senate can confirm who? Appointments to the judicial branch, to the heads of agencies, to ambassadorships. Senate has, can ratify what? Treaties. Treaties. Impeachment, who does the impeaching? The House. The Senate does the trial and conviction. What can Congress appropriate the executive branch? What does appropriate mean? Distribute or give. What does Congress give the judicial branch? They hold the power of the purse, which means they distribute what? They allocate what? Revenue, Revenue what, sorry? Funds. Each department, each agency of the federal executive are given money by Congress. Legislative oversight, when Congress exercises authority over the departments and the agencies of the federal bureaucracy, fill this out. How do you do legislative oversight? How does Congress check the departments and agencies of the federal bureaucracy hold what? They can hold what? Meetings, and they can control that agency's what? Budget. Easy. War powers resolution. Um, two things in the war powers resolution, how they limit the president. They need to let the president know within what? Three hours. When, when the president commits troops to another country, he needs to tell Congress about it within how many hours? 48, 48 hours. Number two. He needs an 